Hi, I'm Shannon. Welcome to this video about Luke Castellan in season two of Percy Jackson and the Olympians or the Sea of Monsters season. Obviously, just to just to say this, the TV show is not a reenactment. That would be very boring. The TV show is an adaptation. And like with season one, they adapted it, they changed some things, and, and I really like the changes that they did. Um, so if you are expecting me to trash on the TV show, this is not the video for you. You should probably leave now. Um, but I wanted to go over kind of what to expect from Luke in this second season of the show and what I think are important things for the show to hit on. Um, so the things I'm going to cover in this video are first, how the Greek world is still in denial about how far gone Luke actually is. And to highlight that, I want to talk about the Luke and Selena situation. Um, also, Luke and his past with Annabeth and Thalia. And then to end the video, to talk about the last fight in this book between Luke and Percy and how absolutely brutal that fight is. It's much worse than I remember. To start with, Luke is absolutely the golden child of the kind of Greek pantheon. And for that matter, Percy is definitely the scapegoat. Percy has this weird distinction in these, in the first five books of the Percy Jackson world, that he's basically like a human reminder for everyone else that he runs into that Luke is evil and they don't like that and they take that out on him. It's absolutely unfair, but they do it. They do it a lot. Everyone does it. <laughs> Almost everyone does it to him at some point. He himself as this like great guy who helped all the new kids at camp, who taught everybody how to sword fight who was welcoming to everybody and you know that hashtag good guy and he's not actually that ha he's actually a hashtag good guy in the way that we the internet tends to talk about men that are like nobody loves me because of blue the uh, yeah that's actually luke um but camp for that matter and hermes most definitely is still in denial just about how just how far gone Luke is. And you would think that they wouldn't be considering that 12 year old Percy was almost killed by him when Luke was 19. But that sort of denial is something that's really hard to completely accept. It's really hard to accept that somebody is not who you thought they were and that they've been taking that like kind of denial or like just obliviousness that you have about them to do just the worst possible things. But that's really what Luke is doing. But because of that denial, Percy is put in like positions where he's where he has to fight Luke in this book specifically that is like very dangerous for him because he's only 13 years old. He hasn't had a lot of experience at this point in fights. Luke is literally the one who taught him how to fight. And so he hasn't really had the time yet to learn his own kind of fighting style. Like his fighting style is more like, um, it's more like intuitive and impulsive in a good way. Like he doesn't necessarily follow the rules. He kind of just does things um, that make sense to him at the time. He doesn't like follow like a set plan. He just kind of sees what he can find and and, and get through it. And that's like why he's able to succeed in most of the fights that he's in. But in this book slash in this season of the show, he's kind of put in these horrible positions because Hermes tells him to go and save Luke. And like, Hermes, are you really telling a 13 year old kid to go save your 20 year old son when the last time he saw, when the last time Percy saw Luke, he tried to kill him. Whether you're going with like the book scene with the scorpion or the show scene where he's standing over Percy's body with backbiter up, obviously about to stab him before Annabeth throws her dagger at him to get him to stop and he leaves. Either way, both of those scenes, Luke was planning on killing Percy because he wouldn't join him. And he, def and he just continues 
on that vein in this season, every time they fight, he's just trying to kill Percy. He doesn't, it's not like a, it, there is no back and forth with, with Luke. He just wants to kill Percy and almost does, which I'll talk about later. Main thing with this season, of course, is Thalia and her tree being poisoned. Thalia, Thalia was his girlfriend <laughs> um, when she died, when she sacrificed herself. And here is Luke po poisoning her tree on purpose. Now, granted, anyone who's read the book knows that he did this because is part of Cronus's plan for them to um, save her tree, which thereby brings her back to life. But, you know, most of the book, we don't know that. And even if that is the plan, it's an outrageous risk to poison her tree, knowing that that might not work and she might just die. Um, and he just does it anyway, because Luke doesn't care. Like, simply put. Um, but the thing with her tree that I think is one of those things that is really important to point out about Luke and his character in season two is the Luke and Selena situation. So Selena Beauregard is an Aphrodite kid and she has quite a big role in these books, though you don't really, I'm honestly very curious about how the TV show is going to handle this. If they're going to tell us that she is the mole and like early on like this next season or season three or something or if they're going to leave us wondering and guessing and then reveal it in season five like the books did so um essentially what is going on here is that luke is using selena as a mole to tell him what is going on at camp because in sea of monsters the first time they go to his his ship the Princess Andromeda. Percy and Annabeth think that they're going there and going to surprise him, but Luke knows that he that they're coming. Luke knows that he's that they're on their way, and so they get completely ambushed by him. The reason why Luke knows that they're coming is because Selena is his mole in camp and is telling him what's going on. Now, why is Selena doing this? Because Luke is manipulating her, grooming her, and taking advantage of the fact that he knows that Selena has a crush on him, so she already has positive feelings about him. He knows that people at camp love him. Like, he was basically like the camp dad figure for everybody before this happened. He knows that people at camp want to still believe that. They don't want to believe that he's a bad that he's a bad person and is like completely irredeemable, especially at this point, like I said. Um, and he also tells Selena, like, if you work with me and if you help me and tell me these things, less demigods will die if you tell me what's going on. And you can't really blame her for wanting to believe that. And so you would want to feel like, well, what if I, what if I don't tell him what's going on and he ends up doing worse things? And especially the way that, of how manipulative Luke is, I... It's very easy to know that he likely made her feel like she would be responsible if something did happen to the kids at camp, if some kids died. she Even if he didn't say that, she would feel responsible likely for that by him involving her into this. And that's honestly one of the main ways that abusive people groom you and especially like make manipulate you is to make you feel like you're a part of the bad things they're doing. So that you feel responsible when in reality, it's completely their fault. <laughs> He's already reneged on that by poisoning Thalia's tree. He tells Selena, tell me information about what's going on at camp and, and less demigods at camp and stuff will get hurt. And then immediately poisons Thalia's tree, which takes away all of the magical protection that they have from monsters. And so camp is being attacked by monsters. This is like the one place these kids are supposed to be safe and suddenly they're not safe anymore because of Luke. And so it's like literally five minutes into this whole situation with Selena, you're already proving that you don't actually care, that you're not actually doing this, that you're hurting, that you're still hurting everybody. And it's just ridiculous that he can't even pretend 
Like, he doesn't want to just kill everybody for five minutes just to, like, give some, like, goodwill. And so the next thing that I feel like is a big thing that they're going to hit on in season two is the past actions that happened with Annabeth and Thalia and Luke when they were on the run when they were kids. And the thing that I think is a big thing with what happened in the past is showing how Annabeth still cannot see how she was wrong about Luke and continues to be wrong about Luke. And it's not common for Annabeth to be wrong about something, of course. But she is in this situation and you can understand why it's hard for her to realize it. Her denial specifically is really hard for Percy in the later books, particularly book four, a little bit in book five, but particularly book four, it is really hard on him to have his, like, one of his closest friends, Annabeth is obviously very important to Percy, for her to be saying things like, oh, I hope you're happy, when she has no choice at that point but to see that Luke is evil and he's never coming back. Like, Percy doesn't want Luke to be bad. It's important for the show to kind of set up where that denial came from, why it's so strong. And so for me, the reason why it's so strong is because Annabeth is the scapegoat of her mortal family. So for those who don't know, um, Annabeth, they they did have a scene of, like about this in the sh- in the show as well. But um, Annabeth's dad, her mortal dad, is very emotionally not there. He is very distant. He gets married to a mortal woman. They have kids together. And his wife very much thinks and treats Annabeth as if she is the source of all of their problems. That her being a demigod and monsters attacking her and things like that are putting their kids in danger. And all of the problems that come with demi- being a demigod, they blame Annabeth as the source of that, which is patently absurd because Annabeth is just a child and she just is here. She's She didn't make like Athena bring her to life. Athena did that on her own, but they're blaming her for it. And they blame her so much for it that she runs away when she's in first grade, when she's seven years old, because her, because her dad's wife tells him like it's either your daughter or it's me and our kids and she doesn't want to find out she doesn't want to wait for her dad to tell her that he's choosing somebody else and so she leaves and even though she's out in the street she never goes back to her dad's house because she knows that she's better off without him which really says just like how bad that situation at home was but because she is the scapegoat of her mortal family One thing that definitely happens with scapegoats is that when we find somebody to kind of replace that mortal family, we then become like completely dedicated to that person. And the thing that can be bad about that is if that person doesn't deserve that sort of dedication because they're not actually that good of a person. It takes us a really long time to figure that out because we're so attached to the idea of what this person we th- of what this person basically represents to us it doesn't even matter who they actually are it's so hard to let go of that once we've once we've attached to them in this way and that is definitely something that happens with Annabeth like 7-year-old Annabeth thinks that Luke wanting to fight all the different monsters and wanting to fight all these people and stuff when they're out on the road before they get to camp, means that he's a big, strong, tough man that will protect her because she's used to somebody like her dad that is extremely emotionally distant, doesn't actually do anything, doesn't do anything active at all to show that he cares about her. And so to her, like, somebody like Luke would would be, like, amazing, would be revelatory, would make her feel so loved and taken care of. Of course, the problem, though, is that a big part of why... Thalia had to sacrifice herself in the past and she was a tree in the first place is because it took them so long to get to camp because Luke kept wanting to fight everyone and everything. It's one of the ironic things I think about this book is that 
Annabeth and Percy get upset at Clarice because she purposefully wants to fight like the sea monsters in the Odyssey. They don't need, they could go around them. They don't need to fight them. There's ways to go around them where they don't have to confront them. But, but Clarice wants to confront them on purpose because similar to Luke, she wants to like prove basically her worth because of Ares being a horrible, monstrous person. Um, anyway, Percy and Annabeth get mad at Clarice in this book because she's doing that. Because that is not how Annabeth and Percy do things. They're not going to fight any monsters unless they absolutely have no choice but to do that. If they can get around not having to confront somebody or confront something, they're going to they're gonna go around it because that's like the smart thing to do. And I think it's kind of ironic that in this book they get mad at Clarice for purposely fighting some monsters when they don't have to. And it ends in some not great things happening because of that. While at the same time, Annabeth is still wanting to believe that Luke is a good person and she hasn't gone back to look at her past memories with Luke when she was young and like re-look at them from who she is now. Because like even 13-year-old Annabeth in Sea of Monsters, if she looked back at those memories as what she thinks now, she would not feel the same way as she did when she was young. But she hasn't done that. It takes a long time, honestly, for for people to be able to like relook at past memories and like detach yourself from how your younger self felt about them and look at them through your eyes now. It's not an easy thing to do that. It makes sense why she doesn't, but that's why she has such strong denial for so many books after this. It's because she is so attached to this idea that Luke is the one that saved her. He never saved her. She saved herself. The most ironic thing I think about all of that is that Percy is the one that gives her that. Percy is the one that gives her unconditional love and support. Percy is the one that gives her a found family. Percy is the one that actually does all of the things that she thinks Luke did when she was younger that he absolutely betrays her over. And it's kind of amazing how in the books going forward that Annabeth and Percy's relationship goes through some hard times because she is so attached to the idea of Luke being that person and ends up messing up the relationship she has where that is actually giving her what she thinks Luke was trying to give her but he's not capable of doing. So last thing I want to cover in this video about about Sea of Monsters Luke is the last fight scene. This fight is fucking brutal and it's kind of shocking how horrible this last fight is because it's not something that fandom talks about very much but I've one thing that happens with the show is that because of Walker Scobell's face and how good he is at acting, like you don't need the narration from Percy in the TV show because you can just watch Walker's face and see the exact emotions that Percy is feeling at any given time because he's so good at that. Because of that, there are scenes that I feel like are going to hit the fandom much harder than they did when you, when we read the books. Because him acting it out just forces you to feel things more than maybe you did just by reading them. But this fight scene, like, let's just, let's just read through this, like, some of this fight. I rolled again as Luke's sword slashed the deck chair in half, metal pipes and all. I clawed towards the swimming pool, trying hard not to black out. I'd never make it. Luke knew it too. He advanced slowly, smiling. The edge of his sword was tinged with red. One thing I want you to watch before you die, Percy. He looked at the bear man, Aureus, who was still holding Annabeth and Grover by the necks. You can eat your dinner now. It is my jeans were ripped above the knee. I was hurt. I didn't know how badly. Luke hacked downwards, and I rolled behind a desk chair. I tried to stand, but my leg wouldn't take the weight. 
And then Luke slashes the desk chair that he is hiding behind. So Percy is hurt enough that he can't walk. And he's literally crawling around on the floor. He's trying to get to a pool to heal himself, but he knows he's not going to be able to get there. Luke is standing over him, smiling, holding his sword out. The only reason, and this is like, I feel like, the most important thing about this fight scene, right? The only reason that Luke doesn't kill 13-year-old Percy in this scene is that he wants to make him watch his best friends get eaten by a monster first. Like, that is the only thing that saves Percy's life in this scene, is that Luke wants to make him watch that as the last thing he sees before he dies. And, like, we can talk about how Luke is doing all of this because he knows that Camp is going to cure Thalia's tree and bring her back to life. And we know because if you've read the Titan's Curse, you know that Luke thinks that Thalia will be on his side. And so he's having fun in this scene. He's literally having the time of his life taunting 13-year-old Percy and scaring the crap out of him before he thinks he's going to kill him because he doesn't think they will need him anymore as the prophecy kid, because now Thalia will be the prophecy kid and Thalia will be on his side. And so he doesn't have to put up with this kid anymore. Annabeth doesn't want to believe that Luke is as bad as he actually is. He is telling a monster to eat you. And and Annabeth, after this scene, still believes that Luke could be redeemed for multiple books after this. Like, that denial that you have when you're the scapegoat is strong as hell. But this scene is absolutely horrifying. And I feel like none of people take it seriously. Like, there's levels of being a villain. Like, I see people talk about Luke sometimes of like, oh, he was manipulated by Kronos and um, he wasn't that bad. And oh, it's sad that like Percy didn't join Luke. Luke was really sad because Percy didn't join him. Luke is a monster. He wasn't manipulated that badly by Kronos. Luke is excited. He is so excited in this scene about killing a 13-year-old child that he doesn't think has any value or worth to him anymore. Because that child didn't want to join him and let his body get possessed by the most evil being in their world. So that they could kill all the people that that child loves and cares about. Like, that is Luke's plan. And I feel like this fight scene is going to kind of force parts of the fandom that want to believe that Luke was just, like, well-meaning, but he got lost. Like, I don't know, Hermes. And kind of slap them in the face a little bit. Because there is nothing well-meaning about any of this. He is a monster. He is angry. He wants everyone to be afraid of him. That is the only thing that Luke cares about. 